Hello YouTube and welcome back to another AB Helicopters video. Today we're going to be talking about the night rating. Now it's a part of the video series How to Be a Pilot and this is part two of this particular topic, the night rating. So in the first video we had a quick overview of the night rating itself, talking about the various theoretical and the flight training aspects of it, including some of the, the weather limitations and uh, the requirements to do a night rating. We're going to really pick up from where we left. Um, we were talking about the uh, impact of flying at night on your body. We're now going to go on to actually the weather. Now, flying at night, um, the helicopter itself doesn't actually know it's flying at night. And in fact, the performance of the helicopter can often increase. As the air cools, gets a little bit more dense, you get a greater performance out of it. However, the, the major difference really is is the weather. You can't see what you're about to fly into. And for that reason, it's extremely easy to fly into a weather condition that in the during the daytime, when you could see it, you would avoid. The, the way to mitigate this particular risk is to do a thorough um, and detailed weather briefing. So what do, what do I mean about this? Well, if you're flying on a moonless night, then you may not be able to see the horizon, in which case you won't be able to clearly distinguish any clouds. And in fact, the only indication that you may get is you're about to fly into a cloud or indeed now flying in a cloud is if your landing light or, or your navigation light suddenly create a bit of a glow around the helicopter. Um, whereas obviously uh, during the daytime you, you'd have a really good indication as the, the horizon drops away, the visibility drops and then obviously you, you end up in cloud itself. Next up, we cover a little bit uh, inside the cockpit. So what instrument systems do you have available to you and what uh, what errors and functions can they provide and what, what happens, for example, when you have an electrical failure, um, what's, uh, what's your emergency cockpit lighting system? Then coming on to navigation, well, what sort of uh, map marking do you use for cockpit lighting? We recommend uh, red light. So the, um, the natural thing there is not to use a red pen to highlight your route because it really won't be very clear. What else can you use um, to, to aid your navigation? Well, I suggest highlighting around major roads and cities um, with, a, with a dark pen um, so that they, they look very clear. And also con consider what you're actually going to be able to use to navigate. So lakes, rivers, railroads, or fields, they all fade into blackness. So um, cities and major roads are the, appear as a fantastic um, maze of light and they can be great navigational aids. Also, illuminated towers um, uh, that often are difficult to see by day unless you're quite low level and can see kind of against the horizon suddenly come to light, uh, literally against the night sky because they'll be illuminated with some sort of red um, uh, beacon at the top of them. Um, likewise, uh, while some smaller roads are invisible, um, cars, street lights, and traffic uh, illuminate. Um, busy uh, intersections uh, and uh, major roads as well as motorways. Airports, um, now airports, some, some of them can be quite difficult to see um, if their runway lighting is, is it's actually very directional. So actually when you're looking side onto it, you may not be able to see it. That said, a lot of airports have um, uh, what well, airports have their, their beacons on, so, so it'll be a, a bright flashing beacon that you'll be able to see. And that's also a good navigational aid. Now, the whole point uh, of revising the instrument flying section um, before the night rating starts is to recap those radio navigation principles and also how to escape from flying into uh, to, to, to bad weather. Um, so it's worth considering well, what sort of VORs, NDBs, and, and do you know how to configure your GPS before you go flying at night? Because they can be great navigational aids. Um, it's also worth talking about the minimum safety altitude. So, a quick uh, way to figure out an approximate safe altitude is to uh, look at the maximum elevation figure uh, shown on a one to five hundred thousand chart. So, this number is usually denoted two different digits: one in a larger font, one in a slightly smaller font, and that denotes the highest elevation. Um, within that segment of the chart. So, for example, uh, around Abu Goveni, 1.9 symbolizes 1,900. Now, the chart only denotes obstacles that are above 300 feet. So, we should add another 300 feet to get a true interpretation of what the maximum 
obstacle will be within that region. So 1,900 plus 300 equals 2,200 feet. Now we need to be 1,000 feet above that if it was a built-up area, 500 feet if it was, uh, uh, if it's, if there's no other uh, obstruction. So we'll add 1,000 feet onto that. So actually our safety altitude within that region is now 3,200 feet. Similarly for around Denham, uh, northwest London, we have uh, the figure one, two, in the box indicated um, so we had 300 feet to that 1500 and then another thousand feet on top of that 2500 now we're just going to take the opportunity to discuss in a little bit more detail some of the spatial disorientations that a pilot may suffer when flying at night um, and uh, some of them uh, admittedly are more appropriate towards the fixed wing side of things um, but all can obviously have an effect whilst flying and can be fatal unless they're corrected. So we'll start off first of all with the stomiographic illusion. Now this is um, effectively where uh, when the body is subjected to acceleration um, it thinks that it, uh, the, the head is going back. Right? You, you, you put your head back when you accelerate. Um, that can lead to some pilots when they apply power um, or they start to accelerate to actually think that they're starting to climb and then their reaction is to put the cyclic or the stick forward and actually cause the, the aircraft to crash into the ground just because they're accelerating, they think they're climbing and they're trying to counteract that climb because they want to stay level and actually end up causing the aircraft to hit the ground as they put their nose down. We'll now move on to something known as the leans. Now this is something, if it's not corrected, can lead to a graveyard dive or spiral. And it's a stomachogyral illusion. Basically, as you roll into a turn, let's say a, a left turn, um, you roll into the turn and your vestib vestibular system detects that you're turning to the left. However, if you fly uh, a nice steady angle of bank, steady rate turn, after about 30 seconds or so, the vestibular system catches up with the aircraft and no longer does your body feel that you're in the turn. It just feels that that turn to the left-hand side, if it's kept constant, is now the new level so it redatums your vestibular system redatums that the turn is actually straight and level well this is fine until you come to wanting to level out again so when you level out the aircraft your vestibular system actually thought that level was when you're in a left turn so when you're actually flying level you actually now feel that you're in a right turn now this can cause then a disagreement between what your eyes are seeing with the instruments that are telling you that you're actually straight and level and your vestibular system is actually saying no you're turning to the right um, so this illusion of turning to the opposite direction can lead to a spatial dis disorientation where you don't detect the turn the nose starts to drop and then you continually go round uh, and, and round and if you were to pull back on on the stick to try and uh, maintain your altitude that will just tighten up the turn and eventually as the turn increases um, the, the, the nose will drop further you'll lose altitude and this is how it can lead to an uncontrolled spiral dive next up you have Coriolis um, now this is this is when you, you're flying along and you make an abrupt head movement say you need to suddenly you've dropped your map and you have to go and pick it up again or you, you've dropped something down by the controls as you look down and then back up again the the fluid inside your semicircle semi semicircular canals uh, will suddenly be stimulated and uh, and it'll sense that you're turning obviously the aircraft isn't, but you've moved your body, um, and it then can lead to disorientation, sickness, um, and it actually can produce a sensation of tumbling, um, and your instinctive reaction may be to correct any perceived motion um, or, or of the aircraft, even though the aircraft itself has not done anything. We'll just quickly cover a couple of other illusions that can be fatal. So first of all, autokinesis. Now this is what happens when you are staring at a bright stationary light set against um, a pitch black background. Say it's a light from another aircraft or even a star. Um, after a couple of seconds, it can actually feel uh, that you perceive that this light is starting to move towards um, the aircraft itself. Uh, this is where the term autokinesis comes from. Um, and then actually that can lead to, to you thinking that it's gonna be a collision situation and then having to take some sort of avoiding action. Um, really, 
the, 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 the key deterrent here is just to try and maintain a, a, um, a normal scan pattern, try not to stare at a bright light as, as, uh, for, for too many seconds at a time. It also is worth at this stage talking about the night blind spot. So um, when you're looking at a, an object and during the daytime, you, your eye has a mixture of rods and cones, which can pick up either color or black and white. You have a, a phobia, uh, an area where there's an intense uh, concentration of those cones, which is great for looking at daytime. However, what happens at night, there's a less concentration of the rods, which are great for black and white night vision flying. Um, as a result of this, it means that if you look directly at an object at night, then you won't actually be able to see it particularly well. So the trick there is to look about 10 degrees either side of an object uh, that you're trying to determine at night and you actually get a much better picture uh, in your mind's eye rather than looking directly at it. Whilst we talk about um, the, the effect of, uh, of darkness and, and black and white, there's the black hole effect. Now, when you're flying at night um, and there's actually very few lights or identifiable ground features, um, there, there can be an illusion that the, the aircraft, the helicopter, is actually at a higher altitude than it is. Um, and this then can lead to you flying a lower than normal approach. You think you're too high, you can just see a single pinprick of light against a sea of background. Uh, it makes you think that that light is quite far away, uh, and then as a result, you then fly closer to the ground um, where you're at risk of, uh, of hitting the, the ground itself or an object on the approach to land, for example. Um, commonly, you, you can get it when you're going from a, a brightly lit airport um, right to a pitch black featureless sky and that disorientation can lead to vertigo as, as you go from uh, an area where you have a number of light sources which provide those references straight into uh, absolute black blackness um, where you can also get that autokinesis as well. So to combat um, both of these effects you've got to trust your instruments. Um, they don't know that they're at night uh, and that they are actually telling the truth. Slightly less common, but um, the effect of the slope of a runway can have an effect on uh, on how high or how low you are um, when you shoot an approach. Um, obviously, if the uh, if the the runway is sloping upwards, that will give the illusion that uh, you are too high on the approach. Um, and as a result, you'll then fly slightly normal, uh, lower than normal, uh, and of course you may end up um, coming very close to any objects below the aircraft on the approach path. Likewise, if you are flying on a downward sloping runway um, or, or trying to land on a downward sloping runway, you have the illusion that you're too low, so you'll then position the aircraft uh, excessively high, and that may mean that you have an excessively high rate of descent um, when coming in to land. So there, the trick is to study the airport diagrams to understand if there's any gradient um, or indeed how substantial is that gradient, how, how much higher is the threshold to the end of the runway. Um, and then bear that in mind if you are expecting uh, to, uh, to see um, a slightly different sight picture when coming into land. And finally, false horizons. So if this occurs when you've actually got a little bit uh, of cloud, um, when flying. There isn't too much light, um, but you're looking for a natural horizon. That's how we fly at VFR during the day. We, we look for the natural horizon. Well, if you've got a bit of a cloud bank, it may not be perfectly level. It may be at an angle. Uh, and you, from uh, what little light is available, you can see the differentiation between this cloud bank uh, and the ground below. Uh, and that, that cloud bank may not be flat, it may be at an angle. Uh, you interpret that as a um, as the horizon, as a, as a datum, and you end up actually realize that you're flying around uh, constantly with an angle of bank to align yourself with this cloud bank, which, which may not be level itself. So again, trust the aircraft instruments, the, the gyro, the artificial horizon will tell you if you are flying straight and level. So we've now covered the main parts of the night rating course. So just a quick comment, uh, the key to a successful flight at night is planning. I can't stress that enough. Um, flying at night is incredibly pretty, as we've said before, but it does rob the helicopter of its key advantage um, that 
if you don't like what you're seeing, if the weather deteriorates, you don't have the ability just to land the helicopter because you can't see what's beneath you. Everything is black. So um, planning for the weather and knowing where your alternative aerodromes are and where you can divert is absolutely crucial before you take off. Bearing in mind that with them flying at night, um, far more of the airfields uh, will be shut and they'll be unlit, so your options are severely limited. So really, before you take off, make sure you know uh, exactly what the, the weather is forecast to do, what it's, uh, what it's actually doing right now, and what it's going to be like on route, and which airfields can you go to in the event that the weather deteriorates. That's it for now. I hope you enjoyed this uh, this video on the night rating and uh, the, the whole how to be a pilot series. Leave any questions you have in the comment section below and we look forward to joining you on our next video.